So my name is Austin. My pronouns are they, them. Uh, I am a queer, well, I'm a black, queer, transmasculine, and I'm binary person um, from and in Louisville. Um, I do our practice root work, which is my heritage magic, uh, and I read tarot. Um, and some of the things that I do as far as coping with mental health have a lot to do with uh, connecting to ancestors, spiritual grounding, uh, mindful breathing, and um, tarot, so divining, um, and connecting to my higher self, and uh, cooking. Cooking um, is something that I do as well to uh, ground myself in my body. It's cooking food that's aligned with uh, what I feel like I need at the moment. So continuing to grow a relationship with, with the earth um, is important, especially now. And, um, you know, the best way to do that um, for me is to make teas, foods, tinctures. Um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of what I specialize in. So um, I will give it to you, Sebastian. <laughs> Austin, do you want me to just introduce myself, or do you want me to give my uh, little talk? Um, if you want, you can uh, introduce yourself and go into your PowerPoint. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, so I'm Sebastian Barr. Uh, I am um, trained as a psychotherapist and a psychology researcher. Um, I have a PhD in counseling psychology and um, I'm particularly interested in uh, trauma work, understanding trauma, healing, recovering from trauma, um, and uh, trans people's mental health and mental health needs. I'm trained myself. Um, so I put together a little presentation um, on mental health and um, coping and resilience with a, an eye toward some of the um, things that might be unique about this um, time period. So I'm gonna share my screen and see um, if I can get this going. My, uh, the presentation, can you give me a thumbs up if you see it? Great. Um, so this is uh, built based on my experience as a, a trans person who has, you know, um, emotions. Um, and also uh, just from being in community with trans people, um, from my work as a therapist and also from the research literature. Um, and I'm gonna try to keep it to about 20, 25 minutes. Um, so I want to acknowledge that we are um, in a period right now that is uh, pretty difficult and challenging emotionally for a lot of reasons. And that there are um, people who are watching this and trans people who are not watching this who are being affected by a lot of things outside of the experiences that are unique to um, being trans. Uh, and uh, we've got a short period here, and I think there's some really wonderful stuff being written about mental health and coping. Um, and so I wanted to just zero in on some of the pieces that are uh, unique to our community or more specific to our community. Um, so when I think about what contributes to distress, um, what stressors the trans and gender diverse community face, um, I think about pieces that have to do with gender and body dysphoria pieces that have to do with the outside world and non-affirmation and anti-transgender bias. And then factors that are complicated by being trans or having bias um, against trans people and factors that are totally unrelated to that. And I'm really gonna focus on the, the first two. Um, so I, I wanna get into like what is body dysphoria and what is gender dysphoria um, just a little bit. I mean, if you've experienced it, you might be like, I don't need to know what it is, but I do think it's helpful for us to really um, examine it critically so we know how to tackle it and how to cope with it and, and heal or get relief from it. 
Um, so I think that there's this piece of it that is about the incongruence that um, many trans people feel. Uh, and that can be like body focused incongruence where our experience of ourselves isn't matching up with the, the, some pieces of our body or our experiences within our body. It can be gender role focused and about our experience of ourselves um, not matching up with how other people are interacting with us or what they're expecting from us. And so this can be a private experience or it can be about how other people are interacting with and seeing us. That incongruence leads to a dissonance and a um, disorientation that can cause distress and it can also cause disconnect or dissociation, um, sometimes as a way of coping with the distress. I think that's uh, at, like one important part or a set of layers of gender dysphoria. And then there's this other piece, which I think comes from the internalization of cisgender norms and body ideals of, um, of cis bodies. And I think we live in this soup of society that is cis normative and heteronormative and frankly like white and Western um, supremacist. And those uh, ideals and body norms exist out there. And because we swim in this water, we also take it in. Um, and so I think sometimes when we're experiencing that dysphoria, uh, it can be about uh, our bodies and our experiences conflicting with beliefs that we've realized about what bodies should look like or should be or what gender should be. Um, and it can also come from internalized transphobia um, and I think feelings of um, disgust and rejection. And that's again, we live in a transphobic society and so sometimes we really take that on. But there, there are ways of getting relief from this. And one of the reasons I think it's important to break down the different factors here is it helps us understand how do we respond to this. Um, and so one way is that we, uh, we reduce that incongruence, right? We, we move towards more alignment and more congruence. And this can happen at different levels. It can be a private thing where we start to understand ourselves better. And so we have less of a misalignment, you know, privately. Um, it can be where we have this social or interpersonal reflection back and affirmation, and that can be um, someone shifting how they see us and signaling to us that they see us in a way that aligns more. So that can be diff using different pronouns, reflecting our gender back. Um, and then there are changes in presentation that can be non-bodily shifts or can be body modification. Um, I wanna talk just a little bit more about this because I think in a, in the pandemic during our quarantine that this has, has to look a little different um, and there's unique challenges and unique opportunities. I have heard um, that uh, I've heard from a lot of people who are at home more so they are you know someone who um, is, is, is in more of a quarantine isn't going out isn't, isn't working outside of the home and they suddenly have this unique opportunity to experiment with and explore their gender presentation. And I think a question, if you find yourself in that, in this place, and no matter where you are in your like identity development, I think this is such a unique experience we've not had before. You can say like, what feels good to me? What feels comfortable at a gender level for me or at any level when I'm not thinking about how others are perceiving me or reacting to me? when I'm not imagining myself in someone else's gaze, like what feels right to me. Another opportunity that has you know, arisen from this, if we are um, at home and in, in safe and private spaces, um, is that there might be more opportunity right now to play with our gender expression. Um, I, like many people on testosterone, I have noticed, um, grew a mustache for the first time, right? There's like something about um, this current uh, sort of safety of not having to interact with people as much where you can play around and see what feels right. For some people, this isn't the case. And in fact, the opposite is true. You might be home um, in, in a place where you feel even less able to experiment or, or authentically express and represent yourself and your gender. And for, for you, for people in this category, there, it's even more important to be in spaces where you can get virtual gender affirmation. Um, online spaces, I think about RPGs, uh, role player games, um, different online communities where you can experiment with gender presentation or avatar presentation and what it feels like to get that back. 
Um, I also wanted to, to talk a little bit about some of the medical interventions, because I, I do think that if this is a um, piece of uh, your gender dysphoria and um, what might be healing and relieving toward that, I'm a huge proponent of thinking about uh, gender, affirm, gender affirming medical care as a part of mental health care and mental well-being. And, um, so right now you can start hormones um, through telehealth. Uh, there are a lot of resources um, for that. Uh, I, I know that there are some surgeries that were delayed and maybe there are some surgeries that are currently delayed. Um, some systems are rescheduling those now and are scheduling new. Um, for some um, areas and maybe in the future, we don't know what the pandemic is going to be like. This might be an area that um, affects trans people where we are having to wait to get the affirming surgeries that we need. Um, if you are uh, wanting to move in that direction and you need a letter, you can get letters written um, via telehealth. So if you don't have a primary care doctor, or if you don't have a, a mental health um, clinician uh, who you work with, there's um, a gender affirming letter access project is a group of clinicians, they're licensed um, and they're committed to doing low and no cost letters, uh, referral letters for surgeries and for hormones via telehealth. Um, and that's, you know, from a, a mission statement of wanting to remove the gatekeeping aspect of it. So I've got that link here um, and we can um, put it in the, in the comments also. Oh, something that I came across, which I thought was just so great and like a wonderful example of how the trans community is like really creative and taking care of each other. Um, it was this Trans Clippers project. And so this uh, started a, a few months ago um, it, during the pandemic. Uh, as people were uh, not able to access, safely access typical means of um, hair grooming. And hair is a, an important part of how many of us express our gender. And so it can be a source of gender euphoria and it can be a source of gender dysphoria. Um, and so there's this project that emerged where people were donating and buying hair clippers and distributing them to trans folks who couldn't afford them. Um, and so this is now, and then it's spread to many states. It's, it's in Kentucky, it's in Massachusetts. Um, and it is, uh, anyway, I, I, th I think it's great. And so if that applies to you, I'll look into it. So outside of affirmation, I think there's other important pieces of um, this work of relieving gender dysphoria. And one of them is building different relationships with our bodies. Um, I think a key part of this is physical movement. I think physical movement um, is, has the potential to be a real source of healing for trans folks. Um, I think we deserve to have uh, relationships with our bodies where we feel like um, our bodies are cared for and care for us and where we can feel strength and empowerment and beauty and joy um, and trust in our bodies. And oftentimes gender dysphoria can disrupt that and we might have to be really uh, intentional um, about engaging with our bodies differently. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of different kinds of physical movement that are, you know, for different personalities and different temperaments. I did just want to plug Pony Sweat because it's what I use and I think it's wonderful. Um, and it is a, uh, fiercely non-competitive body positive dance aerobics experience. Um, that's the official uh, <laughs> description. Um, and it's, it's just, you know, it's, it's a semi-led um, like dance aerobics class. Uh, it's through Everybody Fitness, which is this like great queer gem in California that's got everything virtually right now. Um, all of the classes are $5, but they, um, also, if you, uh, they'll waive the fee for anyone who needs that waived. Um, and all of the information is there if you Google them. Uh, Everybody Fitness, also um, Jessica Rahal, whose uh, photo is on here, um, is also a, a, a yoga instructor at Everybody. I think there's just, there's a, there's a lot of this out there. I mean, I, you know, there's a gazillion resources. These are a couple that I know of. Um, I also w w would recommend, you know, hiking or getting outdoors and anything like that where you can really be grateful for what your body um, does and, and is doing and then maybe what it feels like to be in it in those good moments. Um, 
I wanted to do one more sort of plug for a resource here with decolonizing fitness. This is Ilya uh, Parker, who uh, is a trans uh, personal trainer and runs this site. And in addition to just having like amazing resources on there and individual coaching, um, they put together a database of queer and trans affirming fitness and movement specialists. So if you Google decolonizing fitness, you'll be able to find that. Um, and that's just a wonderful resource. Another way of, of shifting our relationships with our bodies is, is through explicit um, practice and um, embodiment work. And there are a lot of people doing excellent stuff in this area um, beyond what I know. Um, one person uh, who I'm familiar with who I think is great is Asher. And they um, have a website and a podcast and a practice, but the website and podcast are free um, called Living in This Queer Body. And I think um, th that's a good place to start for really doing the um, maybe like internal or insight work and practice of existing in our bodies and being comfortable with that and working through everything that comes up with that. So that's a much more explicit way of engaging in this work, whereas doing maybe physical movement can be a little bit more implicit. So then we come to this other piece of the, the, the things that we've internalized that aren't serving us and that are hurting our relationships with ourselves and um, worsening our dysphoria. Um, and so I wanna talk about some ideas for deconstructing cis norms um, and body ideals and embracing trans positivity and body and gender diversity. Um, I think that the first thing to pay attention to here or to, to, to recognize is that we exist in the same society as everyone else, which means we are also desperately lacking uh, visual representation and narrative representation of trans people and trans bodies and trans stories. And so I think they haven't been normalized for us. And so then our own bodies and lives and experiences um, can feel abnormal, which they're not. And so we have to maybe put some effortful practice into normalizing this. We do that by being intentional about the media that we consume. And I think especially sexual media, but I'll come back to that. Um, I really encourage folks to read and watch trans written stories and memoirs. Um, when I was first like existing as a trans person or knowing that I was existing as a trans person, like 10 years ago, it was so hard to find um, literature. And now there's just, I mean, there's YA, there's science fiction, there's adult fiction, right? There's just, there's, there's a lot of stories out there, amazing memoirs. I think really normalizing those stories. And then also thinking about um, the movies and television that you take in and, and um, looking for ones that honor and respect um, trans people and the way that we look in all of its different forms. and. Um, and, and I really also encourage you to take in images of trans people being loved, trans people being desired and respected. The more we normalize that, the more it's easy to, easier to internalize it for ourselves. Um, take in images of trans bodies being celebrated or just existing. Um, and this is where I think sexual media comes in. I talk often um, with clients and friends about the value of trans people in porn and watching porn. Um, now you could watch it for arousal material, cool, um, but you can also just watch it as a way of um, really uh, taking in and internalizing that all of these different ways of being human and having a body um, can be sexy and wonderful and other people can think that and engage in that. And um, I just, I think this is a really um, healing part. There is some really um, not helpful uh, trans focused porn out there. So you want to make sure that you are um, engaging in ethical and affirming porn. But the good news is there's actually a lot of that out there too and you just have to Google it. Cosmo of all places has this um, list. If you Google um, the title of this, you'll find it. 
Um, anyway, I think, the, and well, oh, the other thing that I would say here is that I think this like interesting movement around um, like personal pornography and sort of only fans and all that is another window in way into um, taking part in participating or consuming uh, media that involves like sexy loved trans bodies. Another practice that I encourage um, when you are able, this is not always accessible, is when you find yourself really struggling with a part of your body or a, an experience of your gender, um, pausing and asking yourself who's benefiting um, from your self-loathing um, and really trying to tap into the part of you um, that maybe the activist part of you or the angry part of you that wants to say fuck you to the oppressive um, sources and the systems that benefit from you hating yourself um, and maybe try to resist that and engage in self-compassion and acceptance and appreciation and celebration in active resistance to that. Um, and the other thing that I'll, I'll uh, say and conclude this little section with is to really lean into the moments where you have gender euphoria, where you're really feeling in the flow of your gender experience and people's uh, perception of that or reflection of it, or it's all private and you just feel like you're looking really good or you're loving one part of you, or you're feeling like being trans is the best thing in the world. Just relish in that, celebrate it. Um, I say take all the selfies and I mean it like I just I, right before I made this I went on Instagram and I searched all the public photos for trans is beautiful and like look at I mean it's it is it's so beautiful like do this you should see all the selfies I have on my phone it's uh, you know I'm, I'm trying not to be embarrassed by it. it's like a good like celebrate yourself when you're in those moments um, and that helps you sort of uh, store up the resilience and the self-love for the moments where it's harder to access. Okay, I'm gonna, so time-wise, I, I each of these things we could talk about forever, um, but I do want to um, like leave lot, lots of time for discussion and for um, hearing some of Austin's perspective. And, um, but I, I, I do want to talk a little bit about non-affirmation and anti-transgender bias, because I think we could be having the best self-love day and be feeling really in our, um, yeah, in our bodies and our transness, feeling great. And we can't control how other people are seeing us or interacting with us. And that takes a real toll, non-affirmation and anti-transgender bias. Um, when I talk to mental health professionals and I'm trying to um, educate uh, folks on working with trans people, I really try to drive this home because I think so much of what gets labeled as mental illness in our community is in fact the lasting impact of chronic non-affirmation and anti-transgender bias. Um, some of my work has been around thinking about these as sources of trauma um, and as so, and some of the struggles that we see in our community and that we experience as individuals as being traumatization. Um, and I really do believe that bias um, experiences and the invalidation of non-affirmation are insidious trauma. They are chronic, they are cumulative. Um, this is the, the small but ever present poles of energy toward a survival level of consciousness the reminders that someone somewhere is trying to make you and people like you less welcome on the planet. Um, I, I think that really resonated for me as soon as I found this quote years ago. I was reading Bre uh, Laura Brown is a psychologist, which is great. Um, and also, y'all don't need this, you know it, but if anyone does need to hear it, research bears this out. Like. I, when we controlled for trauma experiences, so even after controlling for um, sort of traditional trauma experiences, the more people, the more trans people experienced bias and non-affirmation, the worse their symptoms of PTSD were. Like these are these are related. Um, let's see. 
So I think, again, I, I actually, when I was preparing this, I was like, how much do trans people really need to hear this? And I do like, I decided to, to reiterate it because even if you know this, even if you have this lived experience, I think it's important to validate that some of this pain, a lot of this pain is coming from the outside. Um, and so this is a, another quote from um, Laura Brown. She's talking about the impact of microaggressions and these sort of insidious oppression-based traumas. Um, also, my cat might jump up here at some point. So <laughs> I see him lurking. Um, so she writes, each drop by itself does little damage. And she's saying this is like acid rain, um, these experiences. Each drop by itself does little damage and may in fact etch the stone in such a way as to make it more beautiful. Thus, in some way, the experience of daily microaggressions may evoke resilient coping responses. Yet each drop of emotion acid creates just enough damage to render the next drop more damaging. At times, the dilution of the acid is such that the particular microaggression is barely perceived. At other times, its sting is more apparent. Over time, a fissure develops in the form of emotional vulnerability that is invisible, so long as certain aspects of the biopsychosocial and spiritual environment remain steady and supportive. Um, I think this just rings so true, and it's a really powerful illustration. Um, of the uh, cumulative impact of experiences that might feel small or just stinging, but really are contributing to this kind of underlying fissure. Um, I also like this quote because it highlights the importance here of our resilience and our support systems and the environment that we're in. Um, because we can have that fissure, right? Like we can experience these accumulating things. And if we've got the right supports in our lives internally and externally, we'll be okay. Um, and it's, it's the distress becomes apparent when we either get too, too much of that acid rain or we lose some of these supports. Um, and so what are these, you know, what are these supports? How do we survive and thrive? Um, I think it, it, it is fundamentally um, starts with community. Uh, I think trans people, we need each other. Um, I think within trans community, we experience solidarity and sense of belonging, uh, which are critical. They're, those are human needs. Um, we share resources. Uh, we are more likely to have our true selves reflected back to us. This, these are our built families where we can trust that we'll be accepted and understood. And importantly, I think within community, we take turns doing emotional and practical labor. Um, and so we are able to have periods of rest and recovery and we sort of tag in and tag out. Uh, so I really encourage people right now um, to maintain or seek out virtual support and social groups. Um, one of the uh, unique opportunities right now is that there are a lot more effort uh, there are more efforts being put into connecting virtually. And so some groups that would have been, you know, only accessible uh, if you were in the region are now open um, nationally or internationally. Um, there's, there's work related mentorship and mentoring for trans folks. This is growing. I think if you search Facebook and the job area that you're in or interested in, um, or if you're a student, that there are communities around that. And then also, I think, frankly, that trans people might need more community right now. And I encourage thinking about ways to do that ethically and safely during the pandemic, and that there are ways to have pods and be in physical community with people right now. Um, and if you have a local trans community, that, that might be um, a really important thing to do. I think I wanna go back, these are the things that we talked about earlier, but if you're working on relieving your dysphoria, uh, you're also going to be um, strengthening your, you know, you're, you're, you're gonna be able to handle more also. So I think that these are all also really helpful um, in terms of withstanding the shit that the world throws at you. Um, and then this is, this is my last 
piece, and this could be a whole hour long talk, um, but there are lots of other sort of sources of um, resilience and stability. Um, so I think, you know, the practice of psychotherapy, I'm a psychotherapist, I think it's so important. Um, I think especially if you're finding that you kind of like know what to do, but you're not doing it in terms of taking care of yourself or responding in certain ways, um, psychotherapy can be a, a really effective practice in getting at what's getting and what's preventing you from engaging with yourself the way you'd like to or starting the practices that you want um, to start. I think I'm, I'm really curious to hear more, um, Austin, about um, some of your work and thinking about spiritual healing as a factor here. Sorry, my cat is not here. There's the tail. <laughs> um, I also wanted to give a shout out to psychopharm and psychiatry, like an important part for many people of maintaining stability or being resilient to um, uh, difficult uh, circumstances. Um, facilitative coping. So I facilit there's, we, we think about coping um, in these two broad categories, uh, facilitative and avoidant. Avoidant is what it sounds like. It's looking away from the stress or the negative experience. Um, sometimes avoidant coping is excellent. Avoidant coping is very useful when you don't have control over a situation um, and or when you're in a context where you don't have access to some of the more facilitative um, strategies or where your own personal internal resources are such that you just like can't do anything but check out a little. And so being able to distract yourself or look away um, or self-soothe repeatedly, the problems never go away and sometimes they get worse. And so we do know that facilitative coping um, uh, in the long term tends to be better. Um, and so what that means is it could be problem focused where you look directly at the source of the issue and you figure out strategies to change that or minimize it. Um, it could be more sort of cognition or thought focused where you work on shifting your own reaction to what's going on and thinking about it or framing it differently so it affects you differently. Um, and it could be emotion based, which is how do you take care of yourself or experience the emotion differently so that you're able to sit with it and, and tolerate the distress instead of turning away from it. Um, that could be its, its whole, you know, a whole evening talking about that too. Um, and then I just wanna give a shout out to Annalise Singh, Dr. Annalise Singh. They are um, an excellent psychologist and they have done some really great work on resilient strategies in the trans community. Um, they, they've put out a few papers that were uh, based on qualitative interviews. So these are all things that come straight from the trans people who participated in the study and who were sharing about how they um, build and, and develop uh, or drive resilience. One of those papers specifically focuses on trans people of color. And these are just some of those, uh, the, the remainder of these bullet points, having a sense of purpose, having a self-generated sense of self and embracing one's self-worth. Um, also that acknowledgement of oppression and its impact. One of the reasons I take the time to say like, yes, like bias and, and, and uh, non-affirmation or trauma, yes, they're affecting you, is that I think it's so important to be able to externalize some of this and to not um, hold on to it and, and internalize all of it that it, it you know it's, it's not it's not your fault right that there's this like shit that's happening to you um, and sort of related to that involvement in activism I think in addition to activism being worthwhile because it could bring about change um, it also I think the experience of working towards changing something can make us feel like we're not just sort of victim to our circumstances. Um, and that plays into the cultivation of hope. Hope's a tricky thing. Um, I think there are strong arguments for not needing to look for hope. Um, and I think there are strong arguments for cultivating hope. Um, so I will not wade into those waters uh, tonight, but I, I do think um, it is something that, that trans people have named as an important thing um, for them, for the people who are in these studies in terms of being able to uh, 
contend with what we contend with. And so that's, that's it for my sort of planned section. Woo. Thank you, Sebastian. <laughs> All right. Uh, that was awesome and very helpful and everything I hoped it would be. Um, and now I have, I have some questions for both of you, but first I have some questions for you specifically, Austin, if that's okay. Okay. First one is a simple one. What is root work? So root work is a uh, black American spiritual tradition. Um, and it is um, sort of uh, anchored in having a, a relationship with the earth and the herbs that um, and herbs, vegetables, um, fruits, just like the products of the earth, and using those to create um, like a spiritual resonance and using the spiritual properties of the plants. And so um, that was a, a practice that uh, sort of morphed from um, the uh, transatlantic slave trade and like the inability to access our indigenous re uh, religions. And so um, root work became an alternative way to practice uh, spirituality in a safe way, um, in a way that blended in with, with the kind of conditions we were forced to, uh, to be in. And so um, uh, Southern root work and hoodoo is rooted in that. Um, and uh, there are a lot of Black, queer, uh, trans and non-binary folks in the city who are root workers and healers and practitioners that um, don't get as much visibility. Um, and so we're working on cultivating that community. Um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, totally, that does. And that is really awesome. I'm glad to hear that that is something that is like happening. That's on the Yeah. Um, okay, so somewhat related. Um, what herbal remedies um, do you find helpful for grounding when experiencing dysphoria? So um, for, for dealing with dysphoria, there's a couple of things. Um, I tend to look toward herbs and um, tend to look toward herbs that are rooted in the gender expression that I would like to feel connected to. So if I'm feeling disconnected from feminine energy specifically, I will look up herbs that um, are uh, associated with feminine energy and I can pick some certain, uh, some things out. Um, and so a couple of those are uh, like soy, estrogen, uh, it sort of, um, it cultivates more estrogen in the body and B vitamins. So I'll like eat more soy or I'll just do certain things like that and then, uh, um, herbs that are sort of a little bit more masculine, so like mint, ashwagandha, yohimbe, those kinds of herbs um, cultivate a, a, a more masculine energy. Um, and so I tend to go based off of uh, the energy I feel like is out of balance mm -hmm. uh, being a non-binary person um, and uh, using the herbs in my food and, and making tea um, and something that's a little grounding for me that's uh, accessible and um, I, I, I should get it at Rainbow Blossom is uh, St. John's Wort. Um, St. John's Wort is uh, an amazing herb for uh, curing depression and uh, calming uh, herb. And it also is a, it's really good for insomnia, um, it's in a lot of the feel good tincture uh, blends that you see in the stores or like any kind of mood enhancers. Uh, usually St. John's wort is involved. Um, and so uh, I use that, I have a blend of that with rose petals and cacao and um, Damiana. And uh, I usually use that and, and that's kind of like what I call my heartbreak tea. Uh, I might not necessarily be heartbroken, but I mean, at this point it's kind of perpetual. Um, and so it's kind of like my, my grounding, you know, just the smell of it. Um, and so, uh, you know, the thing about grounding is anything can ground you, you know, if you feel connected to it. So if it's not herbs, it could be plants, 
plants are really helpful for grounding. Just checking on my plants and being like, you know, did you grow today? Or, or I'm like, what is that? You know, and like Googling what's wrong with my plants. And so um, just having that connection to another life being, whether it's being used in um, a tea or if it's in a pot or if it's in my yard, um, these are things that remind me that uh, my responsibilities are, are bigger than um, are bigger than what is oppressive to me and I can like reach beyond that. And that's the point of grounding. So that can happen with, with just about anything. So um, if you're not into plants, um, you know, crystals, um, yoga, like what Sebastian had said about mindful movement, moving your body. Uh, I practice yoga and deep breathing. I do a lot of breathing exercising, uh, exercises diaphragmatic breathing before I go to bed and when I wake up in the morning to, to make sure I start and end my day um, in a way that I can control. And then the rest of it is kind of, um, kind of uh, a roll with the punches and just kind of like see how I can, um, how I can shift and how I can continue to contribute to my own personal narrative even when other people are not necessarily validating me. So um, that's, that's something important. Um, I wanted to name that um, a really good book that helped me process uh, with uh, gender and transformative justice in a very YA way. Like, let's be real, a lot of us are in the YA phase of understanding ourselves. So um, the book Pet by Akweki Amezi is a Nigerian African non-binary queer writer and um, it is about this concept of monsters and, uh, and how this uh, kid, uh, she's a trans kid, is like processing without using words because she's nonverbal how and what's going on in her city. And so that book uh, has representations of uh, Black trans children accepting parents the, and, and uh, Non, non nuclear families um, represented in that book, and also these concepts of like what is a monster and and um, and who who gets to say what a monster is and and how do we deal with monsters that look like us and so um, I would definitely like recommend that book um, just uh, it's a really quick quick read, but it's so 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 good. Um, and also I wanted to shout out Ilya because I love Ilya's kindred to me uh, with the Colonized Fitness. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I have some other things, but we can get some more questions. All right, yeah. No, that's awesome. And that sounds like a book I'm going to check out. So that's sure. very sick. I appreciate that recommendation. Um, so you kind of touched on this a little bit, uh, but I did want to ask, uh, specifically, how do you incorporate gender affirming like rituals into your daily practice and schedule? So um, I do ritual um, when I do my hormones. Um, I uh, actually like do spell work around it to um, just sort of, as, sort of as a gratitude offering for, you know, experience, being able to have that experience with my body and being able to like um, experience these changes in this, uh, in this very spiritual way. Um, and also um, I have totems around my room that remind me of my reasons um, that I use or I hold. Um, and I spend a lot of time learning about um, gender in nature and, and, and it becomes even more apparent that uh, our classifications don't make any sense. <laughs> and um, that, is, that is a breath for me. And so reading about transness in nature has been like, oh, oh, wow, this is a lot, you know, this is a lot more common than we think it is. <laughs> and then the way that we treat it, and it has more to do with, you know, um, capitalism and the concept of heteronormativity than it does about, you know, what's happening in my body and what my body looks like. And so um, having that established 
that distinguished thing is like kind of a ritual in itself. So watching YouTube videos and learning about animals and learning about nature and learning about how gender shows up or doesn't show up or changes over time and, and reminding myself uh, that I'm a part of that. Um, and so uh, that is something that I do. Um, and also uh, in doing like uh, having a relationship with my ancestors, reminding myself that if I exist, it's because somebody existed like me before I was here. And so I do a lot of ancestral work around trans ancestors that I don't necessarily have the names of, but I can feel their energy. Um, and so uh, having a, a, an altar for trans people, trans life, honoring people who have passed and then um, who have been murdered and also um, just like having that daily ritual of sitting at my altar and saying like, you know, these, these are the values that I want to embody. This is beautiful to me. Like I'm, I'm grateful to be a part of this. I'm grateful to be a collaborate, uh, like to be able to collaborate um, with nature in this way and like kind of making it holy because it is, making it sacred because it is, um, gender is sacred and the, the, um, intention behind someone's gender is also very sacred. And so um, creating ritual um, in everyday things, you know, if you're shaving your face, you're shaving your face, you get to shave your face, you know, it's just like, whoa, this isn't, this wasn't a thing 10 years ago when I wanted it to be, but like now I get to do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to line my crystals up, I'm going to put some music on and burn some incense. I'm going to shave my face. I'm going to take my time. I'm going to learn, you know, the grains of my skin and the patterns that it, it I mean, it's, it's, if you want to shave in a way that like doesn't leave a lot of stuff like going on, like <laughs> agitation and inflammation, you have to like go with the grain. And I didn't know these things until I had to start, you know, putting a razor on my face. And so um, creating like, those little everyday things become rituals. Um, and then, or like getting dressed, if, if, if you getting dressed every day and you choose your outfit and you're just going to the next room, but you're feeling good and you're feeling confident about how you're presenting, like these are rituals, um, everything, everything that we do can become ritual if we're um, intentional about it because that it really comes down to um, intention and, um, and just a willingness to stay connected to who you are and all of the ways in which you could do that. Cause there's a lot of ways to do that. Yes. Also love a ritual. Uh, absolutely thrilled to hear you talk about rituals <laughs> in general. Um, got some new great ideas. Have never really actually thought about the grain, the like how I need to go with the grain. I'm just like, oh my oh, God. The, the first time I shaved, I was my skin was so agitated and I was like, I can't, I can't do this every time. This is stressful, you know? And so and I learned can't. like going with it, but like the the my hair patterns like just sort of calic in really weird places. So then I'm having to be a little bit more articulate than I expected shaving to be. Yeah. Um and so intentionality. It is. So I'll pull a tarot card and just <laughs> What do I need to think about and meditate on while I'm shaving? Because it's going to take a long time. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's super valid. <laughs> I, have one, I have one more question for you specifically, Austin. And um, it is, how do you navigate um, being a non-binary person, like with binaries that are sometimes perpetuated within like witchcraft as a whole? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, I tend to look at uh, masculine energy, feminine energy um, as non-binary energies. They just sort of have like a concentration, like uh, masculine being like an active concentration in one direction and then like uh, feminine energy being active in certain areas. And so but I don't think those are the only ones. I just think that those are the only ones that we know of or that we can conceive of or conceived of because clearly we exist and so um but there are there is a lot of uh genderism and and the concept of who can be a witch and um who and and what a witch looks like um you know and 
I don't, I don't, as a masculine presenting person, I don't really mind, you know, the, the energy or the, the representation of which being feminine people because witches have traditionally like there's such a strong connection to feminine people and like witchcraft as a, a way of, of dealing with uh, patriarchal oppression and uh, as somebody who was uh, born and socialized as a as a black girl I absolutely get it <laughs> you know I absolutely get it and so I don't necessarily feel the need to to uh, to have the representation, but I understand the necessity of it. And so um, I just think like creating that, that other category of uh, trans witches and non-binary witches and making sure that that is a part of the, the, the label for myself as being like, oh, I'm a trans witch or I'm a, I'm a non-binary spiritual practitioner. Um, and I have to name that and assert it. Um, and then, um, you know, like, the rest of it is watching people stumble over how to how to make space for that and you know it but i'm not looking at that for validation because you know if they couldn't conceive of it before they definitely aren't going to get it right right now and so um it really comes down to just honoring that you know some spaces are you know like safe spaces and have historically been safe spaces for femme people and I don't uh, ever want to take that away or try to like um, be a, an, like another masculine presenting or a masculine energy person being like, no, I have to be seen here. It's like, actually, I'm really good with, um, with, with not being seen with my spell work because that, that is a layer of protection. Um, and I, there's so many, um, Black trans femme witches and healers that I know that are like, yeah, this has been a safe space for uh, people of color, for uh, non gender nonconforming people for a while, um, and also for feminine people. And I think that that makes it so beautiful. Um, but I also definitely see the need to uh, create, you know, another space and and um, like but also honor the history of it and, and understand that it's important that um, even if you are masculine presenting, um, there's something very queer and very feminine about using, having a relationship with earth and manifesting out of that. That doesn't have to like, that is, that is such a, a beautiful and, and um, indigenous way of connecting that like it, it feels inherently feminine, even if it doesn't, um, even if I'm not as feminine as, <laughs> as uh, the witches that I see on, on social media. So I just think uplifting trans witches and people being more open about their spell and their spell work and their spiritual work and, and kind of rooting in that uh, will create a sense of community that we need um, so that we're reflecting ourselves and each other back at each other and we can and we can see uh, community because there's a really big community of trans witches out there on social media. So Yes. And check out the Black Trans Prayer Book. Um, that is a beautiful interfaith project that are just stories, poems, meditation, spells that are all written by Black trans and non-binary people and um, that is a, a beautiful source to sort of like step into when you're feeling isolated because there's a lot of us out there. Um, and uh, yeah, I, th I definitely think that's a project that should be, that should be checked out if there is any sort of spiritual isolation happening in the, in the trans and non-binary community. For sure. And I will, um, I will link that when this is uploaded with the transcript. Um, so thank you, thank you for that. Um, and the, the one question I have for both of you all is just like, if you have any advice on how to practice, you know, being mindful and present, like when you're actively dealing with dysphoria. Um, so like there are things you can do to like, I don't know, just that, I'll leave the question at that actually. Um, 
so I'm, I'm, I want to take my time with this because I think, um, I think there are some like easy answers that, that we can give that then actually aren't that accessible in the moment when you're like really actively um, feeling distress. And I think there's a lot of care that we have to take um, of ourselves when we when we find ourselves in moments where we're really in that kind of antagonistic space um, with our our bodies and ourselves where we feel like um, oh am I frozen yeah I think you're frozen yeah I can hear you. Yeah. Oh, can you, you can hear me? Yeah, your audio is still working. Oh, okay, all right, I'm back. Okay. You're back. Okay, all right, I'll keep talking if I, if I freeze again. Um, I, I think we have to take, take a lot of care of ourselves in those, in those moments um, because it, it's really possible to get into this like cycle um, spiral of, oh, I'm feeling dysphoric, like, oh, like, fuck me for feeling dysphoric, or like, well, why can't I just, like, do that thing that I, I heard on the panel where I, like, love myself, or I ground myself, or, um, you know, does this mean I'm transphobic, or, you know, it, it's very easy, I think, to just pile on, um, and I am, of, of, and I, I believe this about other things, too, outside of gender dysphoria, that we have to just kind of love ourselves and accept where we're at in that moment, which again is one of these things we can just say and it's very hard to do, um, but of just having patience for where we're at and that where we're at right now, where I'm like, so if this is me, it's like where I'm at right now is that, I mean, I'll be like, I, I get pretty dysphoric about thighs sometimes, right? Like, this is whatever, that's my thing. And uh, like, that happens. And I'm like, well, fuck, today's a day where I like, don't like my thighs. And this is where that avoidant coping comes in. And I'm like, not going to look at them today, right? Like, this is, I, I'll do a check in. I'm like, do I have the headspace to do some work around this with myself to like, look for the things I love to deconstruct what I'm what I'm doing here? Or is this a day where I'm tired? And I'm, I'm angry or I'm feeling negative things about myself and I need to just say, well, today's not the day. I'm gonna put on some particularly comfortable sweatpants and I'm just, you know, not gonna focus on it. Um, and I think doing some self-soothing also. So um, that might be a time for a special tea or a bubble bath, or if your self-soothing is like running really hard, you run really hard. Um, and then leaning on people if it's really bad too and saying um, get this is a this is actually does require some advanced work because you have to have some sense of what's helpful to you in that moment but if you can do work to know like if it's helpful for you to have people say something nice about what you're feeling dysphoric about if it's nice to have people know so they can just be a little bit comforting and and not actually engaged with you about your gender or your body but giving some people who you trust that like heads up of like, hey, when I'm like this, this would be really helpful for you. So then you have a shorthand, you can say, having like a bad dysphoria day, like, can you do that thing? Or just want you to know, like, I'm having a bad dysphoria day. And then you've got that plan that other people are able to step in for when we can't step in for ourselves. That was awesome. Um, I think right now, like, there's so much that's happening to and around our bodies with the pandemic. Um, like, our bodies are changing, and um, it does create more of, like, a window for dysphoria. Um, I think that some some of it is like just sitting with things um and i know that that's not the answer that people want to hear because it's so like we're so you know prone to extract for for things but 
for me, it, it comes down to sitting with the dysphoria and listening to it and like either writing down like what it's saying and then I'll do some ritualistic burning or, you know, something like that. Or um, I will remind myself that this is a conditioning, that this is a conditioning and that like this is the same conditioning that, um, you know, tells me that my body is undesirable for other reasons, like my skin tone or like, you know, all these other things where um, I have to remind myself or root back to uh, this is how colonization works and this is how it, it, it becomes internalized. And I remind myself that the thoughts are not actually me. They're like this, this tussle between me and the conditioning. And then I can like leave it to have space to do that while I go do something else. Um, while I like do something, I don't even have to do anything that's necessarily connected to my body. I could um, listen to music or call a friend and just say like, you know, like you know, listen to them talk about their problems or something, but something that lets me stay connected to my body, but not stay hyper-focused on it um, because um, I just, uh, I'm trying to get out of the habit of picking myself apart. And I think that so much of dysphoria is like that concentration on like, you just wanna, and it's like the, the picking apart for me um, feels like a contribution uh, to like the harm that I've sustained. And so I just wanna make sure that I'm not um, like continuing with the, uh, continuing to perpetuate any trauma. Like I'm very careful about making sure that I don't um, reenact it. And so I have to ask myself sometimes, like, is this me or, or is this my conditioning? Is this me or is this, you know, the messages that my, my, the people, my adult caretakers when I was a child were giving me? Like, are these messages I saw in the media, where did I pick this up? Because I know it's not me. Like, I know, I know who I am. And so coming back to that of saying, of reminding that even inside of my mind can be collaborative in a way that I'm not necessarily aware of until I'm like, have I gained weight? And then it's like, whoa, whoa, when did I start? You know, why am I attacking my own body right now? I didn't even do anything, you know? And so sometimes it's helpful to just say, wow, I just really hurt my own feelings. Like I'm being really mean. I need to get out of my head if I'm not gonna be thinking things that are contributing to my growth. Um, and so uh, I will sometimes call myself out and be like, wow, I'm being very mean to myself. And I know it's because you know people have been mean to me. Um, and so then I have to be aware of that. Um, but just being aware that the dysphoria is present and in addition to being aware of it, not like running from it, of just being like, of course I'm dysphoric in this society where there's only two genders and three sets of pronouns. And like, that is something that's so real that it's like, yes, this is an appropriate reaction to being oppressed. And I don't ever want to pretend like how I'm reacting to being oppressed is the problem. And so sitting with the dysphoria and being like, yeah, I don't want to be here either. Me and the dysphoria sitting on the couch, both being like frustrated <laughs> because we didn't want to be here. Um, and, and being like, okay with it in that approach and being gentle with it has made it less threatening when it shows up. And it's just like, oh, another day of this. Like, and then it's like, all right, like, let's just try to get through like, what clothes are we trying to wear today? We don't care. We want to wear something like this. We want to wear the flowers on our shirt. We want to, it's just like, what do we want to do? And yeah. there are going to be those days where you don't feel anything, like you don't feel like participating in that. But, um, but like you have to be, you know, the, the one person rooting for yourself. Like you have to be your friend um, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of harm in the world as we're noticing. And so, encouraging that self friendship of actually starting to like yourself outside of a body will help you realize that you're a spirit having a human experience and gender was just made up and so the reactions you're having are normal um and so that's i kind of have these really hardcore self talks with myself where i'm like no this is okay this is an appropriate reaction to what's happening and and reminding myself of that makes me not become 
um, makes me not turn on myself. Um, and it makes me care about myself and have compassion and feel sad and be like, wow, like this sucks today. So um, that's kind of my little bit on dysphoria is that uh, we're like friends that don't really want to be friends, but we can sit in the room together. Yeah. And, and that is progress. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I really, can, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I'll, okay. Oh, I, I was I was just re really appreciating that and like taking it in and thinking like I'm gonna watch this. I'm gonna like watch the recording of this so I can sit with what you just said, Austin. And um, I was also thinking of the benefit then of having external cues. Like you know, if if you're new to the practice of having those kinds of talks and 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 reminding yourself of things having having actual physical reminders out and i've like i have a lot of trans art up in my house of course i've like none behind me to uh show but i have a lot of trans art i got trans bodies tattooed to my thighs right like i have these um external cues to remind myself of some of the things that austin just like put beautifully into words and um that can also be i mean i, I think about um, people who have like post-its on their on their mirrors and shit like there's like it can be very obvious and it can be so useful or it can be very symbolic and it can be a particular plant you know that you know is trying to tell you this thing and is going to remind you of this so I just yeah I have so many post-its they don't <laughs> all have affirmations but I do have quotes from trans writers that I yeah. love and I just I'm always wake up and I'm like yes okay I'm ready <laughs> I can yes. do this <laughs> I love that. And that also connects with what you were talking about with trans ancestors and like really, um, yeah, having that wisdom and energy of people who have lived through this and have offered us so much just about, I, I, I love that. Yeah, I had never actually like conceptualized like like sitting with your dysphoria, like thinking of it physically, I think is actually kind of helpful to be honest, um, because I think that allow that allows you a little breathing space. Like, yes, this is something that is not intrinsic to me. This is something that I can sit with and I can handle it. Um, I don't have to love it, but it's here. Um, so thank you for that. I think that is that is super helpful and and also particularly like having reminders around I think is really good and important to remember and that they don't have to be um so straightforward you can just be like all right this candle this is the candle that lets me know that like it's all right to feel whatever way like I'm not transphobic because like I have this thought about my body and if I look at this candle I'm gonna know that's what's that's what's up um I think that's really cool and helpful um do you either of you all have anything left to say on that uh we're at, we're at like 708 so I don't want to like take up too much of your time 